Let's look into confidence intervals for one population variance. Suppose we are sampling n independent observations from a normally distributed population with variance sigma squared. Our points might be an estimating sigma squared via a point estimate and a confidence interval, perhaps. And here we're going to be assuming that we're sampling from a normally distributed population. If we are sampling from a normally distributed population, these methods are going to work perfectly. But if we are sampling from a distribution that is not normal, these methods can actually work very poorly indeed. A little more on that later. Recall our formula for the sample variance here, s squared. s squared, the sample variance, is going to estimate the population variance, sigma squared. But the point estimate that we eventually get for s squared, we're going to get some value, 1.2, 28.8, whatever. That is going to provide us with a point estimate of sigma squared. But in the stats world, that's not quite enough. We would like to have a confidence interval for sigma squared in a lot of situations. We're going to have to go about these confidence intervals for sigma squared a little bit differently than the ones we have seen previously because the sampling distribution of the sample variance s squared is not normal. So we are going to have to do these intervals a little bit differently than the way we did confidence intervals for the mean. It can be shown that the statistic, this chi-square statistic, that's the Greek letter chi, the statistic n minus 1 times s squared over sigma squared has a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Provided we are sampling from that normally distributed population, this quantity here is going to have a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And we are going to use that notion to construct confidence intervals for sigma squared. A brief little refresher here in the chi-square distribution. Recall that the chi-square distribution's shape and its mean and its variance depend on the degrees of freedom. So just to illustrate a little bit, I've plotted it out for three different degrees of freedom here. 3, 6, and 12. And this is what the chi-square distribution looks like for these. We need to choose the appropriate degrees of freedom in any inference procedure. Now when we are about to draw a sample, this is a random variable because there's some randomness associated with the statistic s squared. So this statistic is a random variable that has a chi-square distribution. And when we are about to draw a sample, the probability that this random variable takes on a value between these two chi-square values is 1 minus alpha. Visually, what does this look like? If we draw our chi-square distribution here, then there is some value out here with an area out to the right of alpha over 2. And we call that value, under my notation at least, chi-square sub alpha over 2. And there's some value over here that yields an area out to the left of alpha over 2, and therefore an area to the right of 1 minus alpha over 2, and that's why we call this value our chi-square 1 minus alpha over 2. And then we have this middle area here being 1 minus alpha. And the probability that this random variable takes on a value that is between these two chi-square values is 1 minus alpha. Now what we're going to do to create our confidence interval is we're going to isolate sigma squared. So we're going to use a little algebra here and get sigma squared on its own. And if we did so, here's what we end up with. And so we just isolated sigma squared. Now remember in this probability statement, the s squared is the random variable. Sigma squared, sigma squared is a fixed unknown quantity, a parameter. s squared is the random variable. That is where the uncertainty is coming from, in the s squared and the variability of s squared and in its sampling distribution. So since we've got sigma squared on its own in the middle, this over here is going to be the lower bound of our confidence interval. That is going to be the lower bound of our confidence interval. And this over here is going to be the upper bound of our confidence interval. So to summarize all of that, a 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for sigma squared is given by these two quantities that we figured out above. So this is our confidence interval for sigma squared. The degrees of freedom are equal to n minus 1. That's the appropriate degrees of freedom for our chi-square values. Let's look at an example here. A sample of seven boxes of a certain type of cereal with a nominal weight of 750 grams had the following weights. I collected this data. This is data from seven cereal boxes that I got, removing the bag, removing the box, just the cereal, and we've got these seven values. So our n is equal to 7, first of all. 
Now, if we were to take the sample mean of those seven values, we get an X bar of 795.3 grams. Now, that's looking to be a little bit bigger than the 750 that they're stating, so seemingly, perhaps, the company's putting in a little bit more on average than it's stating. But that's not the question of interest here. We're interested in the variance. And so if we calculated the variance, our S squared, using our formulas from way back, we would find that that is 315.5714, with the units being grams squared. And this value here is going to give a point estimate, or is a point estimate, of sigma squared, the population variance. But that's not good enough for us. We would actually like a confidence interval for sigma squared. Let's go ahead and find a 95% confidence interval for sigma squared using the method we just talked about. Here's the formula for that method. Now recall that this assumes we are sampling from a normally distributed population. So what we really should do is plot our data points and have a look and see if they're approximately normal. I plotted a normal quantile quantile plot of our data points and it looks okay to me. So what the heck, let's go ahead and use this formula. We found n and s squared on the last page. We know those. So the big thing is finding those chi-square values. So here is our chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom are n minus 1, which is 7 minus 1, or 6. Our alpha level corresponding to this 95% interval is 0.05. And what we are doing is we are splitting that 0.05 into two parts, half of it over on this side. So 0.025 on one side and the other half on this side. So 0.025 on this side. We're calling this value chi-square 0.025, the chi-square value with 0.025 off to the right. This value we call chi-square 0.975, the chi-square value with 1 minus 0.25 off to the right. These are the values that we're going to be subbing in up top. I can find these values from a table or from a computer, and I have actually done that. So I'm just going to jot down here that these values are 14.44. 94 to four decimal places and 1.2373. If you don't know how to find these values, I have a separate video for that. Now we are simply going to substitute these in up here. These are the appropriate values. So now this is no problem. Now this is easy stuff. n minus 1 is 7 minus 1. We multiply that by our variance, 315.5714, and we divide by that chi-square value, 14.4494. And the upper bound of our interval is 7 minus 1 times 315.5714 divided by 1.2373. And if you put that into your calculator, we're going to find that those values are 131.04 and 1530.24. This is our 95% confidence interval for sigma squared. Or in other words, we can be 95% confident that sigma squared, the true variance of weights of cereal in boxes of this type, lies between 131.04 and 1530.24, with the units being grams squared. What about a 95% confidence interval for sigma, the population standard deviation? Well, it only stands to reason that if a 95% confidence interval for sigma squared is these two values, then a 95% confidence interval for sigma is simply going to have endpoints of the square root of those two values. The square root of 131.04 and the square root of 1530.24. And what we end up with there is 11.4 and 39.1 the units being grams. So we can be 95% confident that the true value of sigma, the population standard deviation, lies between 11.4 and 39.1 grams. Now one warning here, these methods can work very poorly when the normality assumption is violated. When the normality assumption is true, the methods work perfectly. When the normality assumption is false, though, these methods can work very poorly. So if these have any practical importance for you, you really should discuss these matters with a statistician to make sure you're not being led astray.